When I originally bought this six-figure BMW supercar for a fraction of its original price, I thought I was getting the deal of a lifetime. In almost a month of ownership, I've only been able to drive it maybe four or five miles as within a few minutes of starting it up, this warning light pops up telling me it's overheating. I should have known better. The car was listed as is, and like the old saying goes, you get what you pay for. My stepmom even tried to stop me, but I didn't listen, and now she's making light of my situation. Just like that one guy that buys those cars that are like crap, and he puts way too much money in it. You know, that guy. And I promise I'll finish, unlike my son Sam. He's probably gonna ask me for more money. Now, even though she's right about that last part and my stepmom is brutally honest, she always does her best to make me feel better. And after spending the entire weekend trying to pin down this BMW's mystery issue, she told me, Sam, everything happens for a reason. Everyone's heard that cliche. It's just an attempt from stepmom to smooth things over, but in its simplest form, it's the whole reason why I'm in this predicament. I bought an auction junker that the last two owners couldn't fix. What makes me think I can pull this one off? Everything happens for a reason. It sounds so useless, but the answer to our BMW's overheat issue lies within this very statement. What is the reason this car is overheating? There's only a finite amount of answers to this for any car, all of which have been considered by you guys in the comments section. I've never seen the community so thoughtful and inquisitive on any single one of my car projects ever. And for that I say amen and a woman. Besides the thousands of comments, messages, and emails I've received, BMW i8 owners have banded together to offer personalized support on my car's overheating issue. Pat Freeman from Pat's Garage made a dedicated video discussing exactly how the cooling system on my car is constructed and offered suggestions and solutions on how to tackle my issue. Heidi and Franny offered to drive over 2,000 miles from Colorado to Florida just to help me diagnose and repair my car. And one of my other friends, he's got an i8, well, he didn't answer his phone, but he must have been busy or something. It turns out that the BMW community has been one of the most helpful uplifting, diverse, and positive groups I've ever encountered. With everyone but Rich working together on this one, we can't lose. Now all I need to fix this car is a bit of money from Stepmom and the shop manual for my i8. Since this car is a hybrid drive that is quite a bit different from other BMWs, the shop manual will be key to making sure the repairs are done properly. I downloaded this manual over at eManual. It costs a little over $20 and it's the same interactive manual that the dealer and other independent shops use with step-by-step -step instructions and diagrams for any job. If you're a DIYer, you need to check out eManual at the link in the description box. They have thousands of manuals available for most makes and models, and even if it flies, floats, or farms, they likely will have a shop manual for your vehicle. Quickly went, pulled the hood off the i8, and now we're gonna do this repair in a true shade tree fashion, literally, under a couple trees. What I saw after just pulling the hood, because you gotta think, since the hood opens up this way, there's a bunch of stuff that you can't really see, at least not easily, now that it's out of the way. There is a story behind uh, this car. Now there is a small or a minor front end collision on the Carfax for this specific I-8, but whoever did the work did a very, very poor job. First of all, we'll start off with little stuff, missing fasteners. This shroud is only held in place with what looks like four fasteners. You see this little guy that sits behind it? This one is, look, it's completely loose. So uh, when we get the shroud out of the way, we'll see exactly what's going on behind there. We've got missing fasteners, and then this is something that's very strange. When you turn the car on, it tells you something about the headlight not operating properly. I thought I was gonna need a new headlight. Get a little closer. Someone has epoxied this all up. Now that's not abnormal to see some epoxy. Someone's just replacing a headlight with like a used headlight with a cracked tab. But think about it, this is a very expensive car. Whoever owned this car and got into an accident in the first few years of its life, you're telling me they didn't have full coverage? The repair shop, epoxy to headlight, and even better. You see that connector hanging out there? Like nothing's going on on the opposite side. If you look, we've got a headlight ballast right here. These are notoriously expensive, especially on these expensive new LED headlights. A headlight assembly for this car without the ballast is several thousand dollars. I'd imagine the ballast itself is several hundred, if not about a grand. This car is definitely telling us a story, and I can't wait to see what we find underneath all of these panels.
Radiators out, came out very simply, maybe about 20, 30 minutes. And searching for some additional clues, the sticker on top here shows us that this was produced in 2014. Our BMW i8 is a 2014. So that radiator is the original one that came from the factory. But the weird thing is the condenser that sits in front of it has a build date of 2020. So we definitely have a replaced condenser. And remember the car had a minor front end collision and it's very common in front end collision for coolant hoses to break open, radiators to bust open. So if the condenser was replaced, why wasn't the radiator replaced? And it just kind of adds to the depth of the mystery here. It's possibly one of the reasons why our radiator failed in the first place. So no worries, that's gonna get replaced, but for good measure, the same time we're replacing the radiator, I'm gonna throw in a new thermostat. Thermostats are known to fail when cars are overheated for prolonged periods of time and a new overflow tank cap. If you have a failed pressure relief valve within your overflow cap, well, that will also cause a car to overheat. So hopefully this trifecta of cooling system parts will assist us in making sure the i8 stops overheating. We're basically going to do a lot of the stuff that we did last time. We're going to add one new technique, one technique that a lot of people swear by. I've been recommended dozens of times now and potentially the key to our success and that is to raise the car up on an incline when we do the vacuum and fill procedure and it's a very simple theory if the car is sitting like this the engine's back here because it's a mid-engine when the water is being filled into the system instead of it being level and it just kind of sitting in the middle of the car it's now going to rush its way all the way back and fill in the engine where it needs to go make sure that there's very very little air in the system by the time it's full I'm gonna start this thing, drive it in, and it's not gonna overheat anymore. Now these two lines, this one right here and that one right there, the two we need to let loose before we drain and refill our cooling system. And yeah, this one especially doesn't have anything in it. We'll do the other one. Remember, we lost so much water out of this system uh, working on this car, Eurocharge. We lost so much coolant initially, and then we just kept refilling it with water. So at this point, there's nothing in this system water right now as i suspected there is no water in either of the coolant lines now remember there wouldn't be that much in the soft hoses here a lot of it would be in the hard hoses going back to the engine and if you're doing this at a workshop on a lift the car would be level and maybe some would come out of these hard hoses so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to take this car off the ramps and then i'm going to tilt the back end of it up so that way we can drain anything that's left in this system. We gotta make sure we do everything 100% this time. Look. You see the water coming out? All right. Now it's only been uh, maybe a day or two since I pulled the radiator out, but I've been waiting for these two boxes from FCP Euro. Oh, can't wait to throw this in. Of course, our main focus here is the radiator. Now, besides the radiator, I got a bunch of other stuff from FCP or one of the cooler items, our set of replacement door shocks. These were a fraction of the price. The dealership sells them and these are OEM parts. Um, but today we're gonna focus on cooling system components. I've got an OEM a water pump thermostat assembly here. Some replacement coolant right here. Somewhere in here is an overflow cap. I gotta tell you, if you are a DIYer and you repair your own cars, you gotta check out FCP Euro because everything that is in here, like right here is a drive belt. Even if it's a wear item like a belt or like these door shocks that are known to last just like a year on the i8, Everything is covered by a lifetime replacement guarantee. If it wears out or breaks, they will replace it, no questions asked. And again, everything that I bought here was a lot cheaper than going to the dealer. So I'm gonna drop a link to FCP Euro in the description box below. Now let's go ahead and start throwing some of these parts in the car. All right, new radiator set in place. You can see this one has the 2020 build date on it. I don't know if that's good or bad luck. Uh, and this is gonna go back in literally just minutes. But before I do, I just wanna show you a little trick I use because we go ahead and put our hoses in place Place, they've got to be very snug and sometimes you'll think they're snug you'll clamp them in they'll feel snug and then they'll pop off during testing because of all the pressure built up I like to take just a little bit of any sort of lubricant I have and just put them right around the collar here and that'll make things slide on really nice really snug and ensure we don't have any leaks All right, 
This is uh, a pain to get out, but it's not too bad. There it is, thermostat out, third time here. And so just in the case that this was damaged, maybe when the car was overheating or it's no good anymore, we'll swap it out for the one on our new assembly. Right here's our brand new water pump assembly. This is an OEM part from FCP Euro. And I went with a paint marker I marked on the thermostat housing right here. I'm going to show you why in a second. This is a fairly simple water pump. It's got this tiny little impeller on the back because we've all got a tiny little three-cylinder engine. And uh, the only way to get a thermostat for a BMW i8 is to order this entire part. Now, removing this inside the car is as simple as just removing these four screws. The problem is there's no room because you're working between the frame and the side of the motor. I just tell you there's probably about two to three inches of clearance depending on where you're reaching at. Now when I take this housing off and take the thermostat out, I wanna make sure I really inspect what the orientation of this thermostat is like and just compare it to our old one to see in the case it was missing a random piece or something. And then we gotta install it just like it's fitted on our new piece. The parts themselves look virtually identical. Um, looking at the actual shaft and the spring, this spring, okay, the one that came out of the car is already compressed a little bit, whereas this one is not. And then you can see right here the notches on the side where they have to line up. It's perfectly lined up, so I'm not going to move it. I'm going to take this from right here and throw it in the car. All right, the most difficult part is finished. Thermostat is in now. We're going to get back in the front of the car. We're going to raise it up. We're going to leave it up through the vacuum and fill process. That is going to be key this time. Let's see how much of this we can get done before we lose daylight. I have the air compressor kicked on. Remember, we had our thermostat housing open. We had the hoses underneath the car open. And of course, we had the radiator out. So we've got to make sure that this cooling system is completely sealed. We're going to do that by putting it under vacuum as soon as it gets into the red zone here. BMW wants it to be between 0.8 tenths of a bar and one bar so even though this shows red that's what the spec says in the manual if it sits there holds there for a couple minutes that means we're good and remember they want this done for a minimum of 30 minutes so we're going to test the vacuum first if it holds we're going to vacuum it for at least 30 minutes and while it's being vacuumed it will give me adequate enough time to put our trim back in place here and then i'm going to jack the car up even higher it's going to be standing up really tall so that when we kick on that suction it fills this car with water and it gets all the way to the back where we need it to go. So let's go ahead, kick our vacuum on. About two minutes later, we're in the same spot. This hasn't moved at all. So that means we're good to go. I'm gonna kick the vacuum back on, open the valve, and now we wait. We're gonna let this sit as long as we can. See how high I've got the front tilted all the way towards the rear. This vacuum's been running at least 20 minutes now. We're gonna keep it going. I'm gonna go find a clean bucket and fill it with water. Ran out of daylight and it did rain last night, but luckily I had a tarp covering the entire uh, front motor bay, I guess we'll call it, because there's no engine in here. Uh, and we've got a vacuum pulled on the car still. You could see the hoses collapsed right here, but I don't think it's fair just to go off of the vacuum that we did last night. I'm gonna make sure all the air is out of the system. We're gonna run this for another 30 minutes, at least this morning. But before we really run things, uh, what I wanna do is make sure there's gonna be absolutely no air in the system. And a little trick I've seen online is that if you think about it, when this hose starts to suck up the water in our bucket here, this is clean distilled water. It's not clean anymore, I just stuck my hand in there. Uh, what will happen is there's still a little bit of air in this line, right? So here, we'll go ahead, we'll flip this line on. See it's sucking some of the water out there. That's all we want is that little bit of water right there. And then we can go ahead and continue to pull a vacuum. That way, when we suck up the water next time, see there's already some left in the hose now we will have no air all right we've been pulling a vacuum on the i8 over 40 minutes now so i'm going to set the camera down and we're going to make sure that i do this next part to a t we can't mess this up we can't get any air in this system all right shutting the vacuum turning on the valve the big thing i want to do is make sure we don't run out of any water here 
because if we do, then what? We're sucking in air, right? So I'm just gonna monitor this, and as our gauge gets closer to zero, that'll mean that this system is filled up, and I don't want it to get quite to zero. What I notice every time I get all the way to zero is that the tank gets all the way to the brim, and you don't want all water all the way to the brim. Now for our last step, they tell you to crack the bleeder screw, which I've done, and you might notice I've changed it to a brass one. Factory one is plastic, and they always get chewed up. Then you put your cap on, and this cap feels like it's just going on really buttery smooth, which is nice. The other one felt like you were fighting it. And then you close the bleeder screw. Let's crank this engine over and get some uh, heat into the car and see what happens. Now the first thing that I really wanna notice here is some heat going on. We're gonna crank this all the way to as hot as it can go and I'll give them a few bars here. And if the car actually starts to heat, that's a really good sign. That's something we haven't experienced yet. We set out on our first test drive with the diagnostic menu screen on our dash so that we can monitor the coolant temps on our drive in real time. Almost immediately when the car started moving, I noticed the coolant temperatures rising and rising very rapidly. Remember, 117 degrees Celsius is what the BMW diagnostic computer considers too hot and the car easily exceeded this number. I drove back to the shed and did a quick visual inspection. The only thing different that I haven't really noticed before is that the coolant line seems stiff, almost blown up like a balloon. Now I've heard multiple times from multiple sources that it's not uncommon to have to vacuum the I-8 more than once. So I pumped the water just out of the overflow tank this time and did another vacuum procedure, refilled things and went on another test drive. This time the heater was blowing really hot and at one point I noticed the coolant temps drop 10 degrees in a matter of seconds. And see, there it goes, it just dropped down a bit. Look at that. So strange. Wow, come on. Is this it? This is strange. I've not seen it sit at a temperature for so long. Well, there's 106, 107. For a moment, I thought we were home free, but the gauge rose again until the temperature warning popped back up on the cluster. Little glimmers of hope here and there, but no major resolution. So I broke out something I haven't done in a long time, the block tester. This will pretty much guarantee that we don't have a blown head gasket. I've never seen a blown head gasket not show an obvious symptom. This would be a first. I really don't expect anything to come out of this block test, but I can't continually do the same vacuum process over and over and over again. We've done it to a T, done it on the incline, like a lot of people have suggested, and it's just not warranting anything different. The reason why I want to do the block test is just because I see our radiator hoses puffing up and on one side, the only air I know that can enter your cooling system is through a blown head gasket. On the other side, this car is a very strange hybrid with pumps everywhere. Some of them run electronically. So could air be coming from somewhere else? I don't know. This will definitely tell us one way or another. Even though our car runs good and drives good, there's no misfire codes, nothing consistent with a blown head gasket. Uh, the way this works is very simple. You see the fluid that's in here is like a purplish blue and it's actually a chemical that will react to exhaust gases. Now it's really simple. You just sit this on top of the overflow tank and basically you aerate it. See, by squeezing it, you'll suck in any of the air that's coming through the uh, radiator overflow tank. And according to the instructions, if the fluid turns yellow, a combustion leak is present. That means it's sucking in some CO2 through the tube here. But then it also says in low emissions and in diesel engines, the fluid may turn a yellow green. Uh, that's simply because, well, again, there's just lower CO2 in there. So let's go ahead. Hook this up, we'll cross our fingers, but um, nothing's gonna come out of it. I'm getting water in there. I poured it to the line and why is not getting any higher, you know? Yep, I think we got a problem.
Hello, darkness, my old friends. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. <laughs>